Pandemic polemics and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark and the Millennials and the Millennial. Joining me today is Garrick Ross. And of course, Adam Couture, our producer, and Christopher Hopkins, our assistant producer. You guys doing good today? It's a great day. Beautiful weather, sort of. Great day to be quarantined. Yeah, like right. every other day. And we are safely separated here at the Mark and Millennial Studio. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is great during this quarantine pandemic time. And uh, this podcast is called Pandemic Polemics. And the campaign is on because you've got Nancy Pelosi, who miraculously came on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace. That, like, never happens, first of all. But, of course, she wasn't in the studio because of the pandemic. Everybody's interviewed remotely. And she had all kinds of things to say. Chris Wallace, to be frank with you, he's very, he, he's, not, he's not as hard of an interviewer, I've noticed, on Democrats as he is on Republicans. Um, I'm not saying he's a bad interviewer. It's just that he seems to carry two standards with Democrats versus Republicans. And I mean, I know she's the Speaker of the House and so forth, but what better time to be really tough on her? He had a couple of semi-tough questions, uh, if you really want to call it that. We have a clip uh, on this, and it's basically Chris Wallace asking Nancy Pelosi a number of different things about her culpability on February 25th when she went into Chinatown and she said, no, everybody should go. They should enjoy uh, They should enjoy being outside and together. There's nothing to worry about. This was February 24th. This is the same woman that has been attacking President Trump nonstop, saying that what he had what he did or didn't do in the month of February caused the pandemic. He caused the pandemic, of course. We'll talk about the ultimate hypocrite. Here is Chris Wallace and Nancy Pelosi on Fox News Sunday. Here is the clip. You, as you are right now, have been very critical of President Trump, especially for what you say is the time that he lost initially in January and February in responding to the virus. But I, I want to point out that on February 24th, you went on a walking tour of Chinatown to try to promote tourism there. And here's some of what you had to say. That's what we're trying to do today is to say everything is fine here. Come because precautions have been taken. We think it's very safe to be in Chinatown and hope that others will come. If the president underplayed the threat in the early days, Speaker Pelosi, didn't you as well? No, what we're trying to do is to end the discrimination, the stigma that was going out against the Asian uh, American community. And in fact, if you will look, the record will show uh, that our Chinatown has been a model uh, of containing and, and preventing uh, the virus. So I'm confident in our folks there and thought it was necessary to offset some of the things that the president and others were saying about Asian Americans and making them a target, uh, a, a target of violence violence across the country and set, in but, fact, but, some hate. A target. So she's saying, Nancy Pelosi is saying, first of all, did you see her face? I mean, she looks crazy. <laughs> and she's so smug, too. She's got crazy eyes. And she's so smug when she talks. It's like, oh, no, it's, you see, what I did was I went on February 24th into Chinatown and said, yeah, let's promote tourism. Everything is fine. You know, it's really racist what President Trump said, the fact that the coronavirus and the pandemic was actually caused by China. And we don't want that to reflect on these Chinese Americans in Chinatown. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So therefore, I went there and said, let's all go out and support Chinatown during a pandemic. <laughs> I, I think I understand the sentiment. I don't think, you know, the Chinese people or Asian culture should be blamed, especially people who are assimilated in the United States. Not all States. of them, I know. So. Yeah, they shouldn't be blamed, but I also think that, you know, I, don't, I think it was irresponsible for her to be advocating for people to come down to Chinatown. It's like the, the Lunar Fest in New York where, you know, Mayor de Blasio was saying, hey, let's all come down and, and do this you know, and go and, and gather here in this large parade. I mean, it's the same, you know, <laughs> catastrophic consequences. When we're all gathered together, people get sick. And she could have expressed the same sentiments in a letter or done similar interviews like she's been doing for the last couple of weeks. So look, the Senate Democrats on Thursday blocked legislation to add $250 billion to a small business loan program designed to prevent layoffs during the coronavirus outbreak. The move means that Congress won't pass an expansion of the Paycheck Protection Program, which has already run out of money, until this week or maybe even next week at the earliest. 
Uh, the Senate adjourned, and uh, Ben Cardin, I mentioned this uh, last podcast, he actually objected to holding a unanimous vote to be able to at least get this passed through the Senate side. But of course, on the House side, you know, Nancy Pelosi is all smug, and she's on Chris Wallace in Fox News Sunday talking about, no, I mean, I'm the one that's just good with the whole coronavirus thing and the president's being a racist. It's just It's such nonsense that she can't figure out that this is the United States of America that's literally falling apart at the seams. And um, interestingly enough, Nancy Pelosi also went on, and this must be interview week for her, she went on The Late Late Show with James Corden. And at The Late Late Show, she was asked a number of different questions, and she's standing in front of a $24,000 refrigerator eating gourmet ice cream. <laughs> Once again, all smug, like she's this really, you know, rich liberal, which of course she is, a rich progressive. And um, basically, once again, we've got, uh, uh, we have, what is it, Devin Nunes, Congressman Nunes, slamming her for this uh, on an interview. And uh, so here's Devin Nunes talking about Nancy Pelosi's interview on the late late show with James Corden and basically just talking about how out of touch she is with the American people. Here it is. Here's a clip. Any Republican leader, if Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy or any of our speakers in the past uh, would have set, done something like Pelosi did, where she's sitting at home in front of a refrigerator with a you know twenty four thousand dollar you know freezer. Uh, that I don't think too many of us have, except maybe for Griff. I think he may have one. <laughs> he might. Have. <laughs> but uh, but but here's the deal: it would be a fatal flaw. I mean, we would we would boot McConnell or McCarthy out of leadership just like that. They would have been out four days ago the minute that that popped up. When you have, you know, people 20 million people unemployed, you have people that can't get paychecks. You just had on the last segment. They can't even mow their damn lawn in Michigan. Mm -hmm. What the hell is going on? And you know, she's sitting in San Francisco, you know, eating uh, gourmet ice cream. Uh, it, it doesn't fly out in the real world. This is the classic. This is the classic. Let them eat cake, uh, Nancy Pelosi. You know, let them eat cake. I'm fine. I'm I'm whole. I'm rich. I'm Nancy Pelosi. I'm eating gourmet ice cream in my really fancy three hundred thousand dollar kitchen. That's probably at a minimum with my twenty four thousand uh, dollar. What was it? The uh, freezer, you know? Yeah, twenty four thousand dollar refrigerator and freezer with her fifteen dollar uh, a pack, you know, thing of ice cream. While while twenty million people are unemployed. Unemployed, and I'll tell you what, Devin Nunes was absolutely right. We kicked John Boehner out for less. Yes. Yeah. We did, and and the thing is, and and he also mentioned Nunes mentioned. Imagine if Mitch McConnell. Uh, or Kevin this. McCarthy did He'd be the crucified. same thing. They would, and first of all, they should have been if they if they had done s such a thing. They should have been removed from office. They should have been removed from leadership. What I don't understand is why aren't the rank and file Democrats in her party, at least on the House side, speaking out saying, "Do you realize the optics of what was happening there? I mean, the optics of you in front of, in this really fancy kitchen when some people, you know, millions of people actually don't have enough food." I'm sure there's people who told her that it may be bad optics, but I think there's a lot of people out there who might like that. I think, you know, there's a lot, like, you know, for as much as we they sit like around. like it? As much as we sit around here and we're going to be like, you know, we dislike Nancy Pelosi and stuff, I think there's an unfortunate reality that a lot of people just, you know, I idolize her for various reasons and that they think she can do no wrong and that, you know. But her face is so smug and her eyes are like crazy eyes and her mouth looks like it's been, We you know, think that, but to a lot of millennials, she's the, you know, her and Ruth Bader Ginsburg are these two strong female, you know, characters who lead the resistance per se. And I think, you know, I think there's some credit to, or some credence to the idea that, you know, it, it's not going to hurt her. You know, it's just more, you know, political volleyball or, or football. Everybody's punting it back and forth. And do I think it was terrible optics? Yeah. I mean, like you said, it's a let them eat cake moment. I mean, there's Absolutely. a lot of lack of situational awareness there, you know, to those middle American states and to that average working class that the Democrats are trying to covet for this upcoming election that they lost in 16. And I don't think this helps them there. It doesn't at all. And, and we have a hysterically funny clip making fun of Nancy Pelosi, but actually we're making fun of her with this clip. Uh, it's South Park, and I have to set this up. It's a clip from South Park, and if you're a South Park fan, you'll know this immediately because you're a fan, you've already seen this, and so you'll love it even more. If you're not, you're gonna find it equally funny. So South Park, <laughs> it's a community, and you have a bunch of friends and so forth that live in this community, and one of the prominent members of South Park, he decided to buy a hybrid vehicle. <laughs> and um, and his, his hybrid vehicle was called Pius, 
<laughs> <laughs> Meaning he was better than everybody else, obviously. And so the, the gentleman's name was Gerald and his wife, Sheila, and their son, Kyle. And they also have another son. His name is Ike. He's the Canadian, which is interesting. Um, they live in South Park. Well, <laughs> they decide to be really cool and they want to be with other people that are like them, that are really progressive, where everybody thinks the same way and everybody has, of course, a hybrid, um, <laughs> a hybrid vehicle. And uh, so they moved to San Francisco, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi's, Pelosi's home. district. Yes. So the South, this South Park family moves to San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi's home, and they're at a cocktail party with all of these other San Francisco smug elites. And of course, as you probably know, as a conservative, if progressives believe, believe it or not, that cows, when they fart, they're creating too much. CO2 emissions. I do recall there was a certain paragraph in the, the published Green New Deal from the AOC office that got a lot of blowback for that. That's right, and because she wanted to basically get rid of people eating meat, so therefore you wouldn't need cows. Which sit in a field and flatulate all day. Yes, that's exactly right. So making fun of that in their own way, these South Park creators are brilliant. They make fun of that because in San Francisco, when this family from South Park moves to San Francisco, what do you think happens? What do you think happens? Well, they actually they actually fart at this cocktail party, and it's <laughs> what they do afterwards to try to contain and encapsulate the CO2 emissions. Uh, it's making fun of progressives like never before. And in my mind, this is a great way to make fun of Nancy Pelosi about how of, out of touch they are in San Francisco. We have a clip on this, and you gotta watch it. And here it is. Wow, so everyone here drives a hybrid, huh? Oh, of course. We're a little more progressive and ahead of the curve here in San Francisco. Ahead of the curve. Um, anyway, I'm sure you'll find it much better here. <laughs> yes, you'll find that San Francisco is pretty much more open-minded and grown-up than the Midwest. Ah, ah, ah. We're just a little bit more protective of our environment here in San Francisco. Yeah, we sure are. <laughs> <laughs> so in San Francisco, they're much more progressive. They, so they ahead care of about the, curve the environment. Over there. Yes. <laughs> Great environmental stewards. <laughs> that they that they actually want to encapsulate and eat their own flatulence. Oh, that is disgusting. <laughs> so, you know, when you have a speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States Congress who is so out of touch with the American people, standing in front of her twenty four thousand uh, dollar refrigerator and eating this really expensive gourmet ice cream in her three hundred thousand dollar kitchen, and you hear her talking, and you realize we need to add two hundred fifty billion dollars to the small business loan program so that small businesses can stay alive. And she's so smug, she doesn't care. All she cares about is her progressive causes about saving state budgets and state saving pensions and and more money for all of her crazy causes. Uh, but the people that actually pay the taxes are the small businesses, and they're the people that actually are employing people as well. Do we need to fix state budgets? It's it's an inevitable fact that at some point we might have to financially support a lot of states that are going to be running, you know, revenue deficits. But that can wait. You know, these budgets aren't, you know, in a critical state today. People's businesses, people's finances, people's houses, people's food, it is in a critical state today. We need the PPP in order to keep a lot of these businesses afloat so people can keep their jobs and live a normal life. Exactly. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. And then we have MSNBC's Ari Melber. He asks Nancy Pelosi about allegations of sexual assault against Joe Biden. And does she have a problem with those allegations? I mean, to be fair, these are allegations. There have been other, other allegations in the past, but they are nonetheless real allegations that this individual has made. It's not like someone said that an individual made allegations and that that really didn't happen. There were allegations made. And I think we're talking about this because in the past with other allegations, the immediate conclusion was to always believe the accuser and take them at their word. And in some cases, uh, I'm not saying anything did or didn't happen or you know adjudicating this, but you know, now that the foot is now that the shoe is per se on the other foot, a lot of people are not likely to believe the person who was saying earlier that we should. And there's been a bit of a, a hypocrisy perceived out there with a lot of people. Well, certainly with Nancy Pelosi, because she was all in, and so were the progressives in Washington. When on of course, the Kavanaugh, on the Kavanaugh, on the matter. Kavanaugh matter, yeah. But now with Joe Biden, of course, it's all being. And look, Joe Biden is one of these old school politicians. It's certainly um, believable that he engaged uh, over the course of his. 
uh, you know, lifetime in politics because he'd been in politics his whole life. It's certainly believable that he was a womanizer. Um, but, you know, is it true? We don't know because these are allegations. But we were always told with the Me Too movement that you should always take allegations seriously and investigate them and treat them very fairly and seriously. Apparently not Nancy Pelosi, at least not this time. And we have a clip on this. And here it is. Final question on a different issue. Uh, as you know, uh, there was an accusation of misconduct against Joe Biden. Uh, he has publicly denied it. He is the Democratic nominee. Are you satisfied with his answer? Yes, I am. I, I'm very much uh, involved in this issue. I always want to give the opportunity that women deserve uh, to be heard. Uh, I am satisfied with his answer, yes. She's satisfied with his answer. No further requirement for an investigation, I don't even no hearings. I don't even recall what his answer was. I just remember that the New York Times ran some, you know, cover-up piece saying that, you know, despite his history of, um, you know, inappropriate touching, sniffing, unwanted advances on women, which have been numerously reported. Excessive sniffing. Excessive sniffing, which was mentioned in detail, which is quite, <laughs> quite funny in its own right. They say that despite those things, there is no evidence that Joe Biden has ever had a, a history of sexual misconduct, which is kind of an oxymoron on its face if you look at the two things. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, I don't even know what Joe Biden said about it. I don't think he's fl like acknowledged it. I think he just said no, it never happened, and you know, let the media run cover for him and people like Pelosi doing it for him. So I don't know what you know what answer she's pleased with, but I'd be interested to hear it. Ari Melber of MSNBC asks her the question, and she's satisfied. I mean, the, the word she used is that she's satisfied. In other words, nothing further needs to be done, no further investigation. That's her way of basically saying to the media, shut up, don't ask any more questions about this because we don't want to know. Yeah, I, th I think we should have a credible investigation, and I think with all instances of sexual misconduct that are are brought forward, whether you know in the end we you know the person is vindicated or the person is found guilty, I mean I think everybody should have a thorough investigation. I don't think it's up for political hardball for us to be you know kiboshing this investigation but keeping this one open for the sake of political expediency. But isn't it? It's certainly true that during this the course of this campaign. It's certainly true that you're going to have all of these issues come out on both sides, Always, by the way. Yeah, I mean, on the Republican side and the Democrat side, as it's Biden v. Trump. Yeah, tr Trump in his own right is not exactly a history of, of you know, sexual you know, perfection over there. I mean, there's a lot no, of marriages. Wife number three, yeah, like yeah, and you know, his numerous girlfriends and affairs and things like that. And it's, but that adjudicates itself as well. Um, so, yeah. Yep, it's interesting, I know. So Joe Biden, of course the podcast is Pandemic Polemics, and um, it's interesting because during this pandemic we're seeing how the, the entire campaign is being put forward between the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign because they're, it's gonna be all about China and it's gonna be all about the pandemic, without yeah. question. And so Joe Biden has put out a new ad and the Trump administration has also put out a new ad uh, to, be, to be technical, it was the pro-Trump commercial called Beijing Biden. But we have both of those ads, and they're both about 30 seconds. First up is the new Joe Biden ad, where it, of course, attacks Trump, that he's weak on China. I mean, obviously, Joe's trying to get out in front of this, Garrick. He's trying to get way out in front on the on the fact that he's been in bed with the Chinese. He has a history of Chinese sympathy and, and no being doubt. very, very pro-Beijing. Absolutely. And here is the first clip which is the pro Joe Biden ad. Here it is. He failed to act. So now Trump and his allies are launching negative attacks against Joe Biden to hide the truth. Here are the facts. Joe Biden warned the nation in January that Trump had left us unprepared for a pandemic. Then Biden told Trump he should insist on having American health experts on the ground in China. I would be on the phone with China and making it clear, we are going to need to be in your country. You have to be open, you have to be clear, we have to know what's going on. But Trump rolled over for the Chinese. He took their word for it. The president tweeted, China has been working very hard to contain the coronavirus. The United States greatly appreciates their efforts and transparency. China, I spoke with President Xi and they're working very, very very hard, and I think it's going to all work out fine. Trump praised the Chinese 15 times in January and February as the coronavirus spread across the world. It's a tough situation. I think they're doing a very good job. Are you concerned about its potential impact on the global economy? And yes, Donald Trump did say all those things. It's a negotiating tactic because he was negotiating a trade deal with China. 
at the same time the pandemic started. And so he's trying to get this deal done. And, and at the same time, of course, part of the purpose, the whole purpose of the deal is to start repatriating industries and jobs back to the United States and to make trade more fair. Uh, but of course, you know, naturally that's part of politics. You're, you're, you're of course engaging in lots of hyperbole, but this particular ad that you just saw of Joe Biden's, it's going to be aired really soon in all of the battleground states beginning this month. So what do you think about that ad? What do I think about that ad? Um, I think there's two points here. Uh, the first one is is the history of the Biden administration, you know, being in the Senate as well as the vice presidency does not match with, I think, the reality they're trying to portray in this ad. But that's usually how political ads go. They usually are just trying to paint over some deficiency in their candidate, you know. And we'll explore those later in the Trump clip. But I also think that <laughs> I want to push back a little bit and say that I don't think that there should ever be a time where Trump is being sympathetic to the Chinese regime, even if he is trying to get a trade deal done. I don't believe that we should really be working to get a trade deal done with the Chinese regime. I think that we should be trying to repatriate our business to the United States in other ways. You know, working directly with our businesses, we're instilling some kind of, you know, governmental apparatus to, to achieve that goal. But don't I, you think that's been part of the whole trade and uh, the whole trade conversation with China is if we really compete on a fair playing field with China, it's very difficult, I think, for them to compete with us because it begins the process of supply chains being, being moved out of China and back to the United States. Yeah, but I, I, again, I think there's other ways to do that than to having a full-fledged, like, you know, fair trade trade deal with China. And Certainly I, not complimenting them, but yeah. I think part of that is... That, that's part of the Trump It's part of the style. negotiating and the tactics. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I just personally, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. I, I would take the, I would take the Reagan approach and, and dub them an evil empire and, and assault them at every accord that we have possible. Yeah, but we're dependent upon them. That's the that's, problem. That is the problem. We were never dependent this on is the, the Soviet president. Union. This presidency, Donald Trump presidency, is a transition presidency. Trying to get everybody we're out We're trying of to decouple. China. Yep. Decouple from China. And we can't decouple when we're when we're still... Uh, we can't decouple at least on a dime because we're still very dependent upon all of the industries that are there, that we've shipped there. Right. And that might be a silver lining from this whole coronavirus pandemic because I think it's, and I think we've talked about this on several podcasts now, and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it in the future because it's just this big prevalent theme in the world right now. I mean, we're talking about a giant geopolitical shift in, in worldview. Absolutely. And that is that the United States cannot function as essentially... Um, a subsidiary of China in terms of manufacturing where we have to basically rely on them to produce all of our goods. And and look, I mean, we're sitting here at a table and I'm not exactly the foremost trade expert. I just, like, I, it's one of those things that like it strikes what you're me. Saying, what you're saying is is that the Trump rhetoric should really match what he's actually trying to do. And and I do yeah, agree because I think sometimes, Trump has a difficult time creating a vision yeah. that we can all get behind. Even yeah. though we know what he's doing, the average person, I don't think, and by average person, I mean people that aren't paying just attention to trade. Just casually watch the news. Yes, or, they're yeah. like, well, why is he giving you know President Xi of China a compliment? Yeah, and because that's what he does in yeah. order to get his way, at least. It's part of if you read the art of the deal, it's it's pretty central, a pre prevalent reason of how he goes about the art of the deal being the Trump the book. Trump playbook on how he approaches every deal. And exactly. I mean, you could basically say that every trade deal or negotiation he's ever done has pretty much followed to a T the art of the deal. Interesting. Yeah, it's well said. Well said. So you read The Art of the Deal? I, I've read like parts of it, and, I, and I've seen, because, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, it's pretty Trump style. Half of it is Trump talking about business, and the other half is Trump talking about a thousand different other things that are kind <laughs> and of... Himself, of course, and himself, of course. And himself. So you read the <laughs> important parts, and you take that out of it. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is a transitional presidency. And, it, and look, it's fair. Uh, everything is fair in politics. And obviously, Biden has engaged in hyperbole here because he knows how Trump is going to be attacking him. Yes, he's going to say he's weak on China. Which, which, without which is question. a very valid accusation. Because he's been in office for how many years? 30-something years, yes. 40 almost. I think it's four decades. Yeah. So here is Trump's commercial, which will counter that Biden commercial. It's also 30 seconds, and here is the clip. For 47 years, the D.C. elite has made one country great. Joe Biden has led the charge. I believed in 1979 and said so, and I believe now that a rising China 
is a positive development. China stole American manufacturing and hoarded our emergency stockpile. We're not trying to slow down Chinese growth. Now more than ever, America must stop China. And to stop China, you have to stop Joe Biden. America First Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. Yeah, so that's a pack, America First Action, that put out this, uh, obviously, ad on behalf of the uh, Trump administration, Donald Trump uh, campaign uh, most for campaign, election. Most campaigns don't do super PACs at a federal level. Sure, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of, of what they can say about Joe Biden, because he's, he's had so, there are so many clips where he's talked about China's, China's not a threat, uh, we don't have to worry about them taking our jobs. The I mean, 1978 comment kind of strikes me because here we are at the height of, of the Cold War and there's a lot of, you know, especially in the United States, there's a lot of anti-communist sympathies. And here is a sitting U.S. senator, future vice president, who's saying that, you know, a growth, the growth of a communist regime is a good thing. <laughs> and and it, to me, it just kind of stands out. And like, I just don't understand. It's, I, I personally think if this is their candidate that is really going to be nominated at, at the Democratic convention in a few months, that they're in major trouble. Because they're going to have to play defense. To China. They're going to have to play defense the whole Absolutely. Time. Because there's only one president in my lifetime who has actually, at least in modern America, decided that they wanted to decouple from China. And that is this president. Yep. Um, and of course, the coronavirus whole, the, the coronavirus pandemic has made that an absolute necessity. I'll say it is amazing how quickly we got coupled with them in the first place. I mean, if you think about how the source of our manufacturing was in the 80s and 90s, and with NAFTA, a lot of it was centered on, on Mexico, as well as a lot of South American countries, how quickly in, in a decade and a half, two decades, we went to basically all over China. Well, Warren, Warren Miller, who's on this podcast from time to time, he mentioned, you know, whenever you watch Shark Tank, and I love Shark Tank, it's a great program, what is one of the first things that the sharks say? Where are you manufacturing? And, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm doing it in my basement or my garage. So, well, or, let's move it to China for a dollar, on, like pennies on the dollar. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's, the answer is always on Shark Tank. No, let's not make it into the, in the United States, whereby we can actually employ American citizens, let's go to China and put it yeah. there because it's cheaper. Yeah. And after I, a while, I understand it with t-shirts. You want to get your bonobos and Nike t-shirt from China, okay, whatever. But, or shoes, maybe. Or your shoes, but when it comes time for, you know. Pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals, intellectual uh, intelligence, <laughs> you know, apparatuses, technology, technology. things like that. Ah, well, cell phones. Bring it home. And the cell phone technology that runs them. Huawei, yeah, the biggest, lar the largest Chinese telecom company is essentially, uh, a arm of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, it's if you look at telecom England, telecom manufacturer in the world. Uh, so they're on the forefront of 5G, and they're trying yes, to they do are. a lot of the 5G lines, not just in the United States, which we actually barred them from doing, but also in Europe. Um, there's a couple of European countries that have been indifferent, much to my, you know, aggravation, because they should be on our side in this and not just trying to take cheap goods. But luckily, or not luckily, smartly, Boris Johnson and the British administration over there agreed that. There's no way Huawei can do this. I agree. And, we can't let them. And, we can't let them do it. And we need to espouse the sympathies that I think you and I are sitting around this table, and that a lot of Americans are coming to. And we got to promote that around the world. You know, we have to counter not just, you know, our own our own needs, but we need to count or or assist other countries in developing. Do their you think needs for one well. minute that Joe Biden would would be no. able to recognize that and no. really truly challenge the Chinese on telecom equipment no. and the way that the Chinese government use it uses it to surveil their own people as well as people in other countries? Absolutely not. I mean, just a year ago, he said that China's not eating our lunch. You know, and, and <laughs> come was, on, man! And it's That's like, come, come on, man. man! China's not eating our lunch, but it it's just it's sticking his head in the sand and it's tone deaf to the realities of the world right now. It, it shows you that he's he, he truly is not here. He's not paying attention. He's not. And, and who knows what what's going on in his mind? I agree. So Bill Maher, uh, a great one of my favorite liberal comedians, comedians. classic liberal comedians. We, um, we defended Bill two weeks ago, but I think this is going in another direction. This is, <laughs> <laughs> so Bill Maher decided to interview Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Oh, everybody's Republican favorite. Republican of Texas. He's the gentleman that wears the eye patch. Everybody loves Dan Crenshaw. And uh, Crenshaw is really a gentleman. The oh, way yeah. he talks about issues, it really does it in the He's traditional very, gentleman political way. Very good, you know, um, orator. Absolutely. And good debater. Yes. Um, and so Bill Maher asks him a number of questions, and Crenshaw just takes him down. Because Bill Maher, of course, he's always trying to pepper politicians and put them in a corner, especially, of course, Republicans and conservatives, yep. and make them look like they're crazy or they're out of their mind. And this is actually one of the first politicians, Dan Crenshaw, he's one of the first politicians I've seen on The Bill Maher Show, whereby... 
the politician actually explains very, very calmly mm -hmm. the series of events and what actually is happening in the House of Representatives with respect to legislation. Yeah. And so we have two clips on this. Uh, the first one is about a minute and a half long. It is worth listening to because you're going to really enjoy Bill Maher being taken down by Dan Crenshaw. And here's the clip. Okay, because he was warned. This did not have to happen. Uh, Alex Azar, his, his health and human services guy, January 18th, he warned him about this. And again, on January 30th, Trump said he was being an alarmist. Peter Navarro. Somebody else who talks to Trump a lot told him directly January 29th, you got to get ahead of this. February two days 10th. Later, he, two days later, he implemented a restrictive tra tra travel ban from China, which he was widely criticized no, for. I, you know, that same well, day on January 31st, Nancy Pelosi proposed the No Ban Act, which would be congressional limitation on what President Trump's actually able to do with that with that travel restriction okay but that i mean he lies about that he first of all he well, didn't how does he lie about it what do, he, what do you mean he said he stopped people coming in from china he did not he said he well, was ahead of it 43 countries did it before we did there are still people coming in from china he only stopped yeah, foreign nationals yeah, okay let, 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 let me address that because I, I know that's that's the people are saying right now but the reality is yeah, about forty thousand people came in after that these are u.s citizens and green card holders and passport holders being repatriated u.s citizens so you have to make the argument yeah. then that that we shouldn't allow them in. And I mean, it, it sounds to me like you're fully agreeing with President Trump on this when everybody else disagreed with him. And, no, and if I, you're saying that you wish that, that that travel restriction had been more extreme, okay, fine. I well, mean, I, I, you apparently had the foresight back then, but when nobody else did. But the fact but, is, you okay. know, we, if Joe Biden was in charge at that moment, he's already said he wouldn't have done it. He criticized it as, at the time. Nancy it, Pelosi actually proposed legislation to, to stop it. Yes. So Nancy Pelosi actually put legislation on the floor of the House of Representatives during this particular time when President Trump was thinking about putting the travel ban in place. And her legislation that she put on the floor was the No Ban Act, which would have actually stopped uh, the President of the United States from being able to sign executive orders that would have allowed uh, him to stop people from China and other places where there are terrorism hotbeds and allowing those people to come into the United States. I mean, that's what, basically, in other words, she was stopping the President of the United States from doing his job during a time of national crisis. And more importantly is the fact that this interview between Bill Maher and Congressman Dan Crenshaw, I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anyone take down Bill Maher before, but in a very thoughtful and calm and systematic way. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is the first time I've actually heard that clip and I will say, or the interview, I, I had heard about it, but I will say that this is probably one of the more artful and delicate ways that I've seen anybody kind of approach that debate. And it did it in a way that was pretty interesting. I mean, he basically turned Bill's logic on itself. And to a lot of people, I think that would have been very difficult to do, but he was saying, basically, you guys agree, if anything, you want a more restrictive travel ban, and we couldn't do that because, you know, it's U.S. citizens and they needed to come home. Exactly. Exactly. It was, it was really well done. I just, I just seen so many uh, Bill Maher episodes where there was just an argument, and the argument just gets louder and louder, and it's you really- yelling over each other, and yeah. And this wasn't that. This was, and I think that Maher even said that he really respects Crenshaw, and I think it's mutual in terms of at least trying to have a thoughtful- and calm debate. And we have the second part of that interview. It's only about a minute and 10 seconds long. It is equally wonderful to watch because once again, Crenshaw takes down Marr just very methodically. And here is the clip. Uh, February 25th, he goes to India. This is four days after the White House Coronavirus Task Force said we're going to have to lock down the country. And Dr. Nancy Messonnier who's uh, in charge of the Center for Immunization so, and Res Respiratory so Diseases. Wait a second, let me just finish. She announced this on the 26th, uh, he, uh, on the 25th, that we we're going to have to lock down the country. He said the next day, 15 people have it, and it's soon going to be close to zero. March 6th, he said anyone who wants a test can get it, which is still completely wrong. Okay, let me stick to February, completely as wrong. you go forward, because uh, you I, mentioned February 25th. The day before, February 24th, that's when the administration requested two and a half billion dollars from Congress to fulfill, um, you know, CDC, NIH, uh, and FDA funding to combat the virus and, and the potential spread of it. What happened right then? I'll tell you because I was in Congress and I know what happened. Did we vote on a supplemental funding bill? No. 
Did we wait days to vote? No, still didn't vote on it. You know what we voted on later that week? Nancy Pelosi, the only thing she would put on the floor to vote on was a bill to ban flavored tobacco. That's that's what actually happened. It wasn't it was only a week later that we actually voted on the supplemental funding that the administration requested. So there you go. So Nancy Pelosi. So you have a pandemic. NIH needs funding. And Nancy Pelosi decides to put the flavor tobacco, tobacco, you know, so flavored tobacco like vanilla, you know, vanilla menthol. cigars or menthol cigarettes, uh, those would be banned. Um, and that was what she was focused on because that's been a progressive issue across the country. And that's more important to have less smokers NIH supplemental funding. than to worry about people dying from coronavirus. My goodness. Yes, it's just amazing. I will say it, it's, it's good that people like Dan Crenshaw go on shows like Bill Maher's. And I've seen a bunch of conservatives gutsy. go on Bill Maher. It is gutsy. And I think Bill always respects that. Because I remember, if you get a chance, podcast listeners, go watch the Ben Shapiro, Bill Maher interview where Ben Shapiro has you know the guts to go on there. And Bill credits him and as well as Republicans in general. And he says one of the things that separates Republicans and Democrats is Republicans like Ben and Dan are more than willing to go on his show but, conser- but liberals and, and Democrats are never willing to go on on shows for conservatives. Never, and never. It's, and it's a good way to get your message out there and, and be a surrogate and defend you know, your, your cause. And it's a good way to bring people into the fold and, and, and kind of articulate your position. Because aside from sound bites and the rhetoric that people like Bill would ordinarily spill. It's true. It's very true. So blue state budgets are busted. Uh, blue state budgets are busted. Why? Uh, because they've been overspending for years. And they have these really rich pension programs where if you're a state employee, you get all of your health care paid for. I don't blame them. But then you get all in retirement and you get all of, but you also good get pensions, these really good benefits. great pensions, great benefits. And yeah. not to mention all of the overspending that's occurring. For the last 11 years, we've had a good economy and revenues have continually been growing year after year. And people have been spending under the assumption that the economy would always be good and that, and now with a sudden, you know, the basically f- not just like a small recession in revenues, but a full-blown drastic decrease in revenues. Right, the because economy just stopped. It was there's, just stopped. There's, there's no revenue coming in. Yeah, th- all these budgets are now less solvent. and They were never solvent before because they always show up, these, these blue states. We're talking about Illinois, New York, California, Connecticut. New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, to a certain extent, Maryland. Um, and there are other states, but every single one of those states, they always spend up to the limit that they can possibly spend and knowing full well, and we all know that at some point there's going to be either recession or, or perhaps a war or something worse, and they always live on the edge. And so this podcast is called Polemic Politics also because of the fact that now states want a stimulus to bail them out. But do they want them to bail them out for the lost revenue, which would be one conversation? Oh no, they want a bailout for their pensions. They want to bail out for all kinds of things that you can imagine. So listen to this. Illinois Senate Democrats are asking the federal government for more than $41 billion in federal aid. About a quarter of it, quarter of it would be used for a pension fund bailout. To keep the state financially afloat as the coronavirus pandemic continues to slash revenues across the board. Governor Pritzker announced the economic shutdown would result in $2.7 billion in revenue shortfall. Well, that's like roughly a, a, a reasonable percent of their budget. I think it was like maybe, I've forgotten, I think it was 5 to 10%. But he wants $41 billion, not the $2.7 billion in the revenue shortfall that they have. And because he wants to use $15 billion in block grant funding to shore up the state's spending plans for the next couple of years. Spend, spend, spend. I mean... Here they are. I mean, the average person has either lost their business or is losing their business. They've lost their job. They're not getting paid. Uh, They're trying to find food. They can't pay their mortgage. They can't pay the rent in their business or their shop. And the the state of Illinois wants a bailout. They want a bailout from all of us, but they don't want to, what, help businesses? They want $15 billion in block grants to shore up the state's spending? That's a ridiculous, Mark. I mean, think about how much money that's going to be. You're from New Jersey, so, I mean, your state's, of course, one of them. Yeah, I mean, I also, (laughs) I I have, and because of that, I have a very interesting perspective. At least I think it's interesting. I mean, you guys all might not, but that's beside the point. Anyways, um, (laughs) I don't like public um, pensions. I don't like public, you know, investments like that. If I was in 
20 years older than I am now, and I was really focused on planning for my retirement. I believe that you'd want control of your own. I would money. want control of my own money, and I would yes. want it to be somewhere getting better returns than get, you would be getting through a pension. You take a hundred dollars, and, and, and you, you would have access to it. And you would have access to it in the event that you have you need a rainy day fund or whatever. Yes. If you invest, I've seen a couple of breakdowns, and most notably, I generally look at the Maryland through versus private, you know, comparative because that's just where I am. Um, but typically, Maryland's return on its annual pension is somewhere around two to three percent. If you look at the private option over the last 10 years, we've averaged about 10 to 11 percent in private 401k growth. Wow. Big if difference. you do it year over year, that is an eight percent difference. I mean, that is exponential money towards the end of your career. And I, and I understand that people want to rely on things like social security and pensions for, you know, their retirement. But I, it's just every every time we always come up to points like this where we just aren't sure if social security is going to be around or if the pension system is going to be solvent or if they're going to garnish our wages. So your argument, your argument isn't against the fact that people shouldn't have uh, money as part of their salary to be able to save for I, their the retirement. Way, the way we're it's the doing fact it. that the states are controlling these pensions yes. and then no sooner do they make these promises, but they then they say, well, we've, we've been overspending for decades, now we can't yeah. fulfill the promises or honor the promises. Exactly. So they may tax you $100 every paycheck, but they may be assuming that down the road that they're gonna pay you out $120 and so that there's this continuous shortfall in taxes and money coming in compared to money going out. past promises. Past promises. And, and underfunding. Also underfunding and also people are having less kids compared to what they did, which may seem like a really insignificant point, but it's actually, when you're talking about the math, now you have one child supporting two parents versus four children supporting two parents. And then, you know, so while I may be now paying in, I'm one person trying to support two older people. Interesting. So, you know, de Blasio wants the same thing. He's talking about there are going to be dangerous budget cuts in New York City from the pandemic. Yeah. And so Mayor Bill de Blasio continued to rattle his beggar's cup Saturday night, warning that without a few billion in federal dollars, the city would go broke. The coronavirus pandemic has punched a $7.4 billion hole in the city's budget that only Congress and the Trump administration can pitch. He said in a pair of cable news appearances, without the aid, the mayor said, the city would have to make dangerous cuts. Here, yeah, but here's my thing. You should make those cuts. Like, I, I hate that every time there is some kind of financial inconvenience, we always look to some higher authority to somehow magically drop money in our laps in order to keep things solvent. It's not like that money is from a, you know, secret pot that just magically appeared out of thin air. That's the still, taxpayers. That's still our tax dollars. So it, whether it's coming out of my my state taxes or my federal taxes, I'm still getting taxed. And I'll probably have to get taxed more as a result of this if you keep trying to keep up expenditures and spending. What I find interesting too is, is that the Democrats and progressives always complain about trickle-down economics, but that's exactly what they're, what they're proposing for the for. state. They're yeah. advocating for more federal dollars to the states with no strings attached so that we have state spending and then trickle down economics to the people rather than saying, why don't we shore up all the small businesses so that they can continue to pay their employees, keep them on the payroll since it's not their fault yeah. that the economy is shut down and use that money for that instead because they're the ones that are paying the taxes that support the state spending to begin with. But they're the ones that, the Democrats are the ones that believe in trickle-down economics. I would, even, I would even probably get to some compromise personally where I would be okay with us shoring up the year's revenue shortfall across like certain states and cities because uh, this was a federal and state coordinated shutdown of the economy. And uh, there is going to need to be help there. But do I think that you know people like Pritzker should be saying, well, I have a $2 billion shortfall, but give me $40 billion? $41 do I think, billion. Do I think that's responsible or reasonable? No, not at all. Yeah, and of course, you know, I'm sure part of this is a negotiating tactic, but it just, this is the problem. I mean, we had the, we had the federal tax reform bill that passed a couple of years ago, and that was designed so as to punish those states that overtax and overspend. And of course, have the states corrected, have the blue states corrected the way they're running their economies? No, all oh, they no. had to do was pass a bill that would adjust the state tax, um, state tax deduction, um, and conform it with the, federal, it tax with the federal tax law, and they didn't do it. Because, no, because they, they saw the it as an easy <laughs> way to raise taxes without raising taxes. Without actually having to pass a bill. That's so true. Yeah. So, well, next up, we have the dumbest bill in America. And we have the dumbest bill in America. And Mr. Assistant Producer, do we have a lead up? 
And here it is. <laughs> so, and the dumbest bill in America is the No Ban Act. Oh, we just discussed it. <laughs> so the No bringing Ban Act. Bringing it back, bringing it back. Absolutely. So the No Ban Act. Now, you've heard us talk about all kinds of bans that Democrats want to put ban, into place. Ban, ban, ban. Banning drive throughs uh, banning the use of cell phones. Leaf blowers. Banning leaf blowers. Uh, paper bags. Banning plastic bags. Plastic and, bags. And probably paper bags too, Eventually. I'm sure, some states. <laughs> uh, just ban, ban, ban. But this is a Democrat bill at the United States House of Representatives, and it's called the No Ban the Act. The No Ban Act. But do you think the No Ban Act is to ban bans? Oh, no. no. It's not to ban bans. That would make too much sense, because then the Democrats wouldn't have any more bills to put in. <laughs> this No Ban Act, actually, it's introduced by Congresswoman Judy Chu, Democrat from California. It's H.R. 2214, and it was just put on the House floor last month, and its whole purpose is to, well, let me read you the summary. She, she represents Los Angeles, correct? I believe, I'm not sure if she's a Democrat from California. I'm guessing it's Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, certainly not from the blue areas, you know, not from the country areas. But here's what the here's what the actual summary says: The bill imposes limitations on the president's authority to suspend or restrict aliens from entering the United States and terminate certain presidential actions uh, implementing such restrictions. And among other things, it also deals with religious tr- tr- discrimination, which makes sense, which makes sense. But she's basically saying the president of the United States can't sign an executive order for travel bans, including for the coronavirus epidemic. And it's just incredible. And they put, Dan Crenshaw just talked about this with Bill Maher, whereby he said that instead of dealing with funding issues for coronavirus, she put the No Ban Act on the floor. Yeah. To actually to actually begin the debate on it. Uh, it's just, uh, look, do I think that there were some problems with the Trump rollout of the, the original uh, Middle East travel ban? Yes. Do I think that it achieved any significant um, policy goal? No. But do I think that this bill at this time served any purpose? Because all it was was just a statement against Trump. Because, you know, with coronavirus going on, he puts out his China travel restriction, which we talked about in the Bill Maher clip. And then magically this bill appears on the floor to counter it. And it's just like, where is this rooted in any semblance of of rational thought other than, well, Trump put it out, so it must be bad. It must be bad. So let's do the opposite. So the No Ban Act, it says, before imposing a restriction, the State Department and DHS shall consult with Congress. The State Department and DHS shall report to Congress about the restriction within 48 hours of the restriction's imposition. If such a report is not made, the restriction shall immediately terminate. In other words, putting all kinds of hoops the President of the United States has to jump in in order to be able to to, uh, sign a travel ban, and the most recent travel ban being the ban of travel from Europe and the ban of travel from China to the United States because of an epidemic. And this is what they chose to put on the House floor. That is an interesting bill because I don't understand how that would work given what an executive order is. All an executive order is is a mandate to the people within the executive branch of government and the various cabinet organizations, in this case would be Homeland Security, TSA, and the like, saying that these people from these countries should not be allowed through checkpoints. And somehow giving a report would not giving a report to Congress would magically counteract a, a president's mandate to his cabinet, and I, I just don't understand how it would work. It's just funny that that just the fact that we've been talking about bans, and uh, of course now they don't want bans. You know, it's like the, it, they only want them when they're in control, when they're, con- when they're convenient for them, and, and for some whatever their agenda is, and then bam. You know? So here's Judy Chu on the floor of the House of Representatives talking about her No Ban Act. Here's the clip. That's why last spring I introduced the No Ban Act with Senator Chris Coons, which is the best way to reclaim Congress's power and stop this ban. First, it would repeal all three versions of President Trump's Muslim ban, putting an immediate end to this family separation. Second, it requires a report on the total number of waivers that were granted and the total number that were denied, so we know the truth about what's happening. And third, our bill says that if a president does want to implement such a ban in the future, they would actually have to produce actual evidence of a threat. This ensures that in the future, 
No individuals are denied entry into the U.S. based solely on their religion. With the President confirming that he now wants to expand this ban to even more countries, now is the time to act. Yes, so she was talking about the President wants to expand this ban to more countries, meaning Europe and China, during a pandemic, and is actually speaking against this. And it's just the most unbelievable thing that this is what the Democrats would make as a priority on the House floor. It's amazing to me because like the last time that off the top of my head I can think of a time where Congress created such a sweeping change in authority would have probably been in the 70s with the War Powers Act, which effectively did the same thing, but when it came to waging war. And here we are, you know, putting this bill up before the House because the president was looking out for the United States. You know, he was doing a good thing and trying to get ahead of the coronavirus, and they're trying to punish him for it. And here we are, and he, we are basically in a de facto war with yeah. China. There's, yeah. there's no question in my mind. And because we're decoupling, we're trying to move industries back. It's economic, to, intellectual, and and basically global stature war. It's not a conventional war like we're shooting guns at each other. And we're but trying to survive yeah. in the meantime because they have so much of the production capacity that we need, yeah. and, and, and including not just pharmaceuticals, but the PPEs and, and all these other things, mm -hmm. you know, obviously technology and so forth, manufacturing. And this is... This is what this lady, I'm just sorry, I just don't understand these Democrat politicians that put these bills in to basically, because they hate the president so much. I mean, do they hate him more than they love America? That's what I just don't understand. And to me, it's just, it's just a little out there. And like, I, I understand some of the people who have problems with some of the immigration bans, but I don't understand the timing behind this one. And I, I think we're hitting the, the nail home on this one a little bit. It just, it doesn't make sense because it wasn't like this one was out of some malicious, you know, belief against some ideology or people. It was basically saying, you know, we basically internationally need to stop the flow of travel, especially out of China. Yes. And before this gets bad, and then suddenly that was too too hot to handle. Exactly. Exactly. So that is the dumbest bill in America introduced by Congresswoman Judy Chu. You have the dumbest bill in America, the No Ban Act. And this is Mark of the Millennials. Thank you for joining us with Mark of the Millennials. Thank you to our millennial Garrick Ross. And, of course, we hope to see Warren Miller back. Also want to thank our producer, Adam Katora, our assistant producer, Christopher Hopkins. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and our website. See you next time.